Our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, uh, for all that you've done for us. Let us not take it for granted. I pray that you'll open your word to our hearts and understanding, and then by your Holy Spirit, Lord, move and move our wills uh, and our, our, our desires in your direction. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the, most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington National Cem uh, Cemetery. And it's, it's guarded by soldiers from the United States 3rd Army, or, or Army 3rd Infant Infantry Re Regiment. Man, I can't talk. All right. I went for a long time thinking that those guys were Marines that guarded it because um, they wear uh, a very... Uh, it almost looks like a Marine uniform. It's a, that dress uniform that they wear, but it's an Army uh, regiment known as the Old Guard. The guard on duty does not wear his rank insignia because he, they don't know the rank of the unknown soldiers buried there, so they don't want him, the guard, to outrank whoever they might be guarding. So they don't, don't wear their rank insignias on their uniform, whatever their rank may be. Now, if they're off duty, they can wear it, but not when he's marching. And the, uh, the guard's detail is, his duty detail is very, very strict. He marches 21 steps down, he marches 21 steps south down the black mat laid out across the tomb. Then he turns and faces east toward the tomb and waits for 21 seconds. They do this because a 21 gun salute is the highest uh, military honor. So they do the 21 seconds in uh, in light of that. Then he turns and faces north, changes his weapon to the outside shoulder, and waits 21 more seconds. Then he marches 21 steps down the mat, and he turns and faces east for 21 seconds. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and uh, just keeps on repeating that through his routine um, until he's relieved of duty at the changing of the guard. Now the duties of the sentinels there at the tomb are not purely ceremonial. The sentinel is charged with the duty to confront any people who cross the barriers to the tomb uh, and are disrespectful or loud. Um, their duties are real. And if you, you know if that tomb was not guarded that some moron would come along and carve something into it or spray paint something on it. That's just, you know, there's always a couple idiots that ruin everything for everybody. So his duties are real and they're necessary as much as they are honored and, and hallowed in the tradition of our country. Um, Timothy was like the sentinels at the tomb of the unknown soldier when it came to guarding the truth of the Christian faith. And tonight is, uh, is a special night for me. We come to the end of our study in the book of 1 Timothy. We've worked our way from chapter 1 and all the way through chapter 6. And it has one, one theme really holding the whole book together. Uh, our theme verse, if you remember from this, uh, from this book, is chapter 3 and verse 15. If I tarry long that thou mayest know... How thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so our, the title of our whole study in this book has been, You Can Handle the Truth. You Can Handle the Truth. And uh, that was Paul's concern in writing to Timothy. He wanted Timothy to handle the truth correctly. He wanted to encourage and instruct Timothy in his, in his role in guarding that truth, which was under attack in, in Ephesus, that church there. And his final words of the letter, Paul impresses upon Timothy the supreme importance of a Christian, of, for, for him as the pastor, to guard the truth of the Christian faith. Why? Well, because that truth was under attack in the church that Timothy was placed in charge of. And so we, too, have been entrusted with the sacred truth of the Christian faith. Like Timothy, we have a duty to guard the truth. If you look in your bulletin, I, I don't have much of a duty to guard grammar, but uh, I looked in the bulletin this afternoon and I spelled guard wrong. <laughs> but uh, anyway... 
Uh, I'll talk to my secretary about that. But if we as Christians do not defend the truth, who will? Will the secular world defend the truth? Uh, will will uh, cultists defend the truth? Who will? If we refu refuse to do so, we'll become like a platoon of soldiers who are in the midst of a battle, but they refuse to engage the enemy. And there they all sit in their foxholes, each man saying to himself, I will let the other men rise up and fire their weapons, and I'm going to stay down here and stay alive. The enemy advances unimpeded until, uh, until eventually their position is overrun, and, they are, and they're all toast. How do we defend the faith? I mean, when you get up and go to work, it may not be the first thing on your mind. Today, I'm going to go defend the faith. Uh, most likely, likely you're thinking, do I have time for breakfast? And, uh, you know, or, or uh, should I eat it on the way? Should I risk spilling coffee on me uh, on the way to work? You know, that's what's most likely on your mind. But the truth of the scripture, the truth of the deity of Christ, the truth of sin, the truth of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, the truth of eternal life, the truth of the gospel, the truth of sanctified and holy living, these are the truths of the Christian faith that are under attack in our country, in our life. How do we defend that? Well, we look to 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you're not there with me, and we close out Paul's letter to Timothy here. And we'll find that there are some basic instructions that Paul gives to his young protege in the faith, and instructions how to guard the truth of the Christian faith. So let's look at that in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. How do we guard the truth? Well, if we're going to guard the truth, first thing we need to do is assume responsibility for it. We have to, we have to own up to the fact that it is our duty. Now, as the pastor uh, of the church, I, I believe I have maybe a little bit of a higher accountability, but every church member has the accountability in their life to guard the truth. You have to assume the responsibility for the truth. That's the first step. Here in verse 20, Paul says to Timothy, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. That's a long phrase, that which is committed to thy trust. That whole phrase translates one Greek word, and that is paratheke. And that word describes a deposit committed for safekeeping. And uh, for instance, if you go down to the bank and you, and you take your paycheck and you deposit that in the bank, you would expect that they are going to keep it as safe as possible. That's why they have that thing called a vault, right? Uh, and uh, if it's, <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that joke. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, uh, so the word is describing a deposit committed to somebody, entrusted to somebody for safekeeping. You could almost say like a treasure entrusted to somebody to guard it. My Kristen and I read a we're, we read a book about uh, a secret. Uh, these family was on vacation on the East Coast, and they were looking for buried pirate treasure. And you know, uh, it, I don't know if pirates really did that or not, but that's not smart. You know, to take your treasure and bury it somewhere, and then make a map and leave that conspicuously for some adventuresome preteens to find. That's not smart. Uh, but uh, if you really want your treasure kept safe, you get a safety deposit box or you, you, you find a place, a person you can trust to commit that to. Paul had committed a treasure to Timothy. The treasure was the truth of the Christian faith. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, "...and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses..." The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And so Paul says to Timothy, you've heard some things from me and I want you to take the same thing that I've given you and commit it to other men. We used that text in talking about discipleship a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, Paul has committed something to Timothy's trust. 
Just as a sentinel is entrusted with the tomb of the unknown soldier, and he assumes a great responsibility for that tomb, so Timothy, the pastor at Ephesus, assumed a great responsibility for that church and for the body of doctrine, for the truth of the Christian faith that was entrusted to him. He was to keep it safe. And not only was to Timothy responsible to guard the truth of the faith, but the whole church was responsible to guard it. That's why in 1 Timothy 3.15, as we read just a little while earlier, Paul says "But if I, that the church was to be known as the uh, church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And no doubt, Timothy was given the task of leading the church in guarding the truth, but the responsibility is owned by the entire congregation. Jude understood the responsibility of guarding the truth. And he wrote an epistle, uh, and uh, listen to how he describes the way his epistle is going to go. In Jude, in verse 3, he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was need needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What Jude is saying is, I was going to write you guys a letter and talk about the, just, just the, the common salvation that we have, and we're going to discuss some of these things. He says, I was going to write that way, but the Holy Spirit has changed what was on my mind because there's a need to, 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 in, ex, to exhort you, to encourage you, to stand up, people, and fight and contend for the faith. You know, we're all guards of the truth, of the faith. So we must all assume responsibility for that guarding. Uh, you know, parents can guard the truth. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7 says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk with them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And here, uh, Moses taught the children of Israel and said, guard the, church, guard the truth in your home. Teach your children the truth of God's Word. You do that uh, not only by teaching them the Bible, but living it. You can teach them the Bible all you want, but if you don't live it, you can have them memorize the New Testament, but if you break it all, what are you telling them? You're, you're telling them they might as well have memorized Hans Christian Andersen or something. Um, and so uh, we, we assume that a responsibility in the home. Sunday school teachers can guard the truth. I mean, what, you're, you're not just occupying Sunday school teachers. You're not just occupying an hour on Sunday morning. What you're doing is investing an hour to disciple people. You have, a, you have a responsibility. As a pastor, I have a responsibility in the pulpit to guard the truth and to, and to take God's Word and handle it correctly in the, in the pulpit. Uh, deacons have the responsibility to guard the truth. And you do that by, by being responsible and, and biblical in your decisions. Uh, volunteers that work you know, we got vacation Bible school coming up, and people, or going out and visiting, or whatever. All church members have the responsibility to guard the truth. We have to assume that responsibility upon ourselves. That's how we start guarding the truth for our faith. Now, you you uh, you understand your responsibility in the matter. You, you you do that. You understand that you're responsible. You assume that. So now, what do you do? All right. Uh, if you understand that responsibility, what's the next step? Well, the next step is this. There's a battle going on and there's, there's a war for the truth. It's under attack. Your next step after assuming the responsibility to guard it is this. Depend on your strongest ally in the truth. And that ally is grace. Depend on, depend on your allies in the battle for truth. It's very foolish for a country to turn its back on its allies. Uh, I won't go into the current political, <laughs> I will fight the temptation to go into the current political issues in the Middle East, but let, needless to say, I will say this, America ought to stand with Israel. They are the best ally we've ever had, and yet we are 
on the brink of turning our backs on them so we can link up with despots and terrorists. There's my political rant for the night, all right? It is foolish, it is stupid to turn your back on an ally in, in, in a battle. And so as a Christian, we're guarding the truth, we're attempting that. Uh, the, the best way, one of the things we can do is depend on our strongest ally, and that is the ally of grace. Look at how Paul signs off the letter here in, in verse 21, the end of the verse. He just says this, grace be with thee, amen. Grace be with thee, amen. Um, Timothy had struggled. He is still struggling and will struggle with bad teachers and unholy living in Ephesus. He will ultimately win that struggle. If you look in the book of Revelation, there are seven letters to seven churches. Now, most of those churches had some issues, and so did the church at Ephesus. And, and Revelation was written about 30 years um, after this. But it, maybe some of this is the result of Timothy's work. Listen to what John writes, or these are the words of Christ, actually, to the church of Ephesus. In Revelation 2, the first three verses, he says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Listen to what Jesus says 30 years after Timothy was there. He says to the church of Ephesus, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Sounds like Timothy did some work, right? And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Sounds like Timothy took care of the false teacher problem in Ephesus. Or God did, he used Timothy. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Now we know the next verse goes on to say, I have somewhat ought against thee, you've, lost, you've left your first love. Uh, he didn't say he lost their first love, but they left it. Uh, so there were some problems. But the problems that were going on here were problems with false teachers and unholy living. And here, 30 years later, 30 years we think of, you know, we think of Revelation as being totally disconnected from the epistles. But 30 years is, is the span many times of one, one man's ministry. Uh, and I don't know how long Timothy, he wasn't there 30 years. But, um, but I say, I'll have to say this. Timothy would struggle in, with these false teachers and unholy living. I think he won the battle. I think when, when Paul gave him the, the uh, assignment to guard the truth, he successfully fended off the attacks. What would bring about that victory for Timothy? Strength of character? No. Timothy was a timid man. Paul had to write to him the second letter and said, don't be ashamed of my testimony and the testimony of the Lord. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So strength of character, character, boldness, no. Power, no. What was it? Grace. Grace be with you. As Paul signed off his last instructions to Timothy to set that church in order and to guard the truth, Grace be with you. He could have said anything. He said grace. You know what Titus, Paul writing to Titus in a similar situation, he says in Titus chapter 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God brings salvation and appeared and teaches us these things. So if we're to guard the truth here at Grace Baptist Church, we must depend solely on grace, right? What does depending on God's grace mean? I mean, what does that look like in real life when the rubber meets the road in practical situations? What does that mean? Well, grace saved us. Grace then sanctifies us as we just read here in Titus, grace teaches us how to live for the Lord. For the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us. Teaching us what? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So grace teaches us how to live for the Lord. But grace also gives us the power to do that. How does grace give us the power? In Titus he said, looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace points us away from temptation and points us away from our trials and points us to Christ. That's what grace does. Uh, grace enables us to guard the truth. We think of, in, in our day and age, the, the truth of God's institution of marriage is under attack. They're trying to redefine marriage in our country. They've successfully done it in Ireland in the last couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, uh, many churches are embracing that. You know why? Because they're, they're not living by grace through faith. They're just trying to get along. Jude 4 uh, talks about the redefinition of grace. Jude writes, For there are certain men crept in unawares who are before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, listen to what they do, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Here are some false teachers, no doubt somewhere in Ephesus, that redefined grace. And basically said that God just accepts any lifestyle without repentance, without dealing with sin, without, without changing people's lives. Does that sound familiar? And, and churches can just, can just bring all of that in and, and, and it's okay as long as they love each other, right? So our church stands for the truth of Christian faith in marriage. How? By grace. It's God's grace through His Word that teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We don't redefine grace to mean that we have a get-out-of-jail-free card and we can just do whatever we want to as long as we go to church, as long as we claim to be a Christian. But that's how grace is being redefined in our country now. There's a redefinition of creation going on. This has been going on since Darwin published his book, um, and people get a little uncomfortable with all the scientific evidence that's, that's presented that supposedly contradicts the scriptures, has never been proven to do so. But some churches embrace a non-literal view of creation, theistic evolution. And, uh, and what we do is we don't throw out the first six chapters of Genesis. We just don't do it. Uh, why? Well, if you're going to throw out six chapters, what stops you from throwing out the rest? Right? And so... We stand by grace for the truth of Christ, the truth of the faith when it comes to creation. That's a foundational truth. Because in the creation account, we find sin. Did you know that the doctrine of sin, if it, if it doesn't stand in Genesis, it doesn't stand? Uh, how does Paul in, in Romans argue? He says, if by one man sin, if by one man sin, death, or one, by one man's sin, death uh, has passed upon all men. And so Paul, in the book of Romans, argues from Genesis chapter 3. It says, death passed on us from Adam. And so if we throw that out, guess what? The doctrine of sin is thrown out with it. Do you think Satan knows what he's doing? Um, so to guard the truth, we must assume the responsibility to do so we have to depend strongly on our, our, our strongest ally, and that is grace. And grace is simply saying, uh, God, I don't know how necessarily you ever wanted to save me, but you did by grace. You did all of that. And so as I live, um, one verse in the, in the New Testament says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. You received Him by grace through faith. You walk in Him by grace through faith. How did you get saved by grace? You put your entire faith and trust in Christ, right? Then how do you live by grace? You put your entire faith and trust in Christ. That's walking and living by grace. And so what else, as we depend on our strongest ally, which is grace, what else is involved in this command to guard the truth? Well, Lastly, we look at this. Paul tells Timothy this principle. Don't fraternize with the enemy of truth. Don't, don't fraternize with, with the enemy that is opposing and attacking the truth. Look at verse 20. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. And he says, Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. 
You've all heard of Benedict Arnold, who is perhaps the most infamous turncoat in American history. Of course, he was a close friend of George Washington. He was a general. Uh, Arnold was a brave soldier. He turned battles in favor of the Patriot cause on more than one occasion by his valiant efforts. He was wounded in the service of our country. But Benedict Arnold married a young lady named Peggy Shippen. Peggy Shippen was the 18-year-old daughter of Judge Edward Shippen. Edward Shippen, Judge, was a British sympathizer who did business with the British Army on a regular basis. Now, Benedict Arnold's wife was not the only factor in his treason, but she was a factor. I say all that to say this, don't fraternize with the enemy of truth. You can't be a loyal soldier to our country and marry one of the enemies. You, you can't do that. And you can't be a loyal soldier to Christ and marry, so to speak, an enemy of Christ. Uh, Paul mentioned two enemies of the truth that Timothy should avoid. This word avoid means just turn away from it, have nothing to do with it. Uh, one of them, he says, is profane and vain babblings. So I could rephrase that ungodly and empty talk, empty chatter, a worthless babbling. Uh, and, and then the, the other uh, enemy here is so-called knowledge. It, he says, oppositions of science falsely so-called, so-called knowledge that opposes the truth. And Paul says, Timothy, turn away from them, avoid them, stay away from these enemies, don't fraternize with the enemies of the truth. What did Paul mean when he said avoid this ungodly and this profane and empty talk? What's he talking about? Well, during the first century, there were false teachers, and he would deal with them here in Ephesus. They tried to add regulations and rules onto the gospel. They were legalists. Um, one such group was called Judaizers, and they sought to make salvation Jesus plus something. All right, Jesus, not just Jesus alone by grace through faith alone is salvation, but Jesus plus keeping the law of Moses. Jesus plus the circumcision uh, and some dietary laws. And this group was very good at arguing. You know, if you want to know uh, something... Uh, People who are into false teaching, they really love to argue. If you don't believe me, go on the internet. All right? There are some people that are, that are internet theologians. I mean, they can argue, and it's just not worth it. I used to get involved in that. I used to engage these guys in internet uh, arguments. And, and long ago, I said, you know what? There is no point in, in doing this. Uh, and so it's time-consuming, and, and it's just frustrating. But... And, and, and it's unbiblical because here Paul says to Timothy, avoid that. Don't do that. It's a waste of time. Uh, and, and so uh, he's talking about these guys that are good at arguing. Uh, and and uh, I think what he did with Hymenaeus and Alexander back in chapter 1, he just turned them out of the church. He said, get rid of them. Paul says, Timothy, don't mess with these people that go on with their worthless questions, empty talk, new doctrines. Avoid them. They came up with genealogies, all kinds of uh, just crazy things, endless things. What did Paul mean when he said, avoid oppositions of science, falsely so-called? Well, this word science translates the Greek word gnosis, which is translated knowledge in many other places. Talk about knowledge. It doesn't mean science in the sense or knowledge in the sense of the scientific field, the way that we think of it in our modern terms. Uh, but uh, gnosis rather means knowledge. And so he's talking about knowledge that opposes the truth. So Paul says, Timothy, I want you to avoid uh, what is falsely called knowledge because it opposes truth and right, the truth of the faith. There's a definite article in the Greek construction of this phrase. If you were to read it uh, literally, it means, or Paul is saying, uh, avoid the falsely so-called knowledge. All right? So it's like, it's like uh, not just a... a it's not just an abstract thing out there. He's talking about a specific thing. The false knowledge. Avoid that. All right? That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Here, I believe, is a, is a reference to, to the early roots of a Greek cult called the Gnostics. And they were people that believed. Um, they, they boasted about their applied knowledge that they gained through their personal spiritual experiences. 
If you say the ancient Greek cult of the Gnostics doesn't exist today, uh, and you say, I don't have to worry about that, I ask you this, has Gnosticism really gone away? Any form of Christianity that elevates the authority of some spiritual experience on a plane above scriptures is doing just what the Gnostics did many, many years ago. And we see examples of that in that philosophy all over modern Christianity. Uh, and so, um, no experience, no matter how sincere, no matter how much you think it is real, should be allowed to trump the truth of the Bible, the Scriptures. There are all kinds of self-proclaimed prophets uh, and vision casters in America, people with this vision and this interpretation and, 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 and that experience, and they're selling books and they're making movies and they're doing all of this stuff. It's one of the hazards of religious freedom. So guard the truth. Don't buy into somebody's extra biblical experience. Try the spirits, John told uh, his readers. You know, uh, I dreamed one day when I was a kid, I dreamed about having a four-wheeler. I've always wanted a four-wheeler. And uh, I don't actually don't want one now, but growing up as a kid, I always wanted a four-wheeler. I just, my friends, two of my friends had four-wheelers. I'd go to their house, play on their four-wheelers. One day, I dreamt, I, or one night, I dreamt, and I had the most realistic dream. You ever had a really realistic dream? I had, a, I had the most realistic dream that we had a four-wheeler. And I woke up, it was a Saturday morning, I woke up supercharged, ran through the living room, got to the garage, opened the door, and I could not believe that there was not a four-wheeler in our garage. There never had been. Uh, and, and, and we never even thought about owning a four-wheeler. Well, I thought about it. My parents never thought about owning a four-wheeler. And yet that Saturday morning, it was real to me. And I actually got to the garage before I realized we don't have a four-wheeler. Talk about disappointing. It was horrible. Um, my experience was real to me, but it was not a reality. They're going to come here and bring an invitation hymn uh, or, or a closing song here. And we have a duty to guard the truth. You need to assume that responsibility. There's a war on. We need to uh, depend on our, on our strongest ally. That's grace. And then, and then uh, we need to not fraternize with the enemy. Church, you can handle the truth. How do you do that? Keep that which is committed to your trust.